Hang on, man. Hello, Adam. I, I don't see my, I see my name, not my picture, though. <laughs> yeah, me too. On the bottom left, do you see a start video option? All right, right. Okay, there, there you are. are. You're a little blurry. Yeah, my uh, webcam. Okay. Sorry let's about see. that. And it's so soft, but that's my own audio. Well, I guess we'll just wait for uh, the other guys. Uh, thanks for. Uh... Oh, sure. Thank you very much for making this happen, too. All right. Oh, okay. This is better. Yeah, I can hear a little bit better. Uh, where are you? No, you're in New York. <laughs> I, I'm upstate a little bit, so I'm a little bit north of the city. All right. I mean, I, I left uh, recently, but not not actually solely because of, of the pandemic, but there were a couple of other things that went into that decision. But uh -huh. it is really uh, lovely. So you're, you're normally a... A New York citizen? Yeah. <laughs> resident, I should say. Okay. I hold a passport. <laughs> you may need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I've been enjoying the, the book, although I, I I didn't really, I I guess I um, needed, I read the New York Press uh, as it was coming out for most of the tenure of you guys, so, um, you know, I lived down in, near the Union Square area, most of the the 90s and you know i just pick it up every week you know and just read it so it was uh just part oh, of them. those are good old days <laughs> <laughs> yeah these are these aren't the good old days anymore well they will be at one at some point i imagine but, but uh yeah that'll be good that would be a thing get worse yeah yeah exactly I can't let my mind wander there. I have to sort of, God, I see, God, we'll remain yeah, a, we'll take it day by day. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take your advice. Godfrey Cheshire. I see you. Can you see me? I can't see oh. you yet. You have to, um, I guess, enable video, but I can certainly, there you are. We, are right now. we have, uh, good to see you, Godfrey. I'm in this era. It's, it's so Where nice. are you? I can't disclose that information. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm glad you know my humor. Uh, I'm actually uh, right about Ryan, Ryan Beck, uh, Hutz, like little right by Red Hook and Bard College. Okay. That's yeah. a nice area up there. It's it is so nice. Pretty. Yeah. Uh, it is pretty and it's cheaper and it's, I needed a break. I've been, I was very stressed out. My dad died, you know, during this whole thing. And I, oh. I was a little, I had to kind of get out for a while. So, but I'm coming down this weekend. Are, are you going to stay up there for a while now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, you... I'll come come down when I need to, and which will, my son is, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a long story, but we're still figuring out the long term for him, but he's going to do all the re learning remotely. He's in high school, and um, um, his mom just came in with him. And so they're quarantining in Brooklyn. So anyway, that's the situation. Yeah. Uh, so do you know my friend up. Richard Abramowitz? Rick do you know my friend Richard Abramowitz? Uh, is, of Abramorama, that kind? Whatever. The Abrama. Abrama Richard okay. Abramowitz. The distributor? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, not really, but I know who you were talking about. I think I met him. Well, he, he's just moved to um, uh, Rhinebeck. Oh, wow. Uh, so you may yeah, yeah. I'll look, I have to sit, look what he looks like and then avoid him. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing how many people uh, do live up here, and um, you know that. For, I mean, it's it's not really that amazing, I guess. It's uh, it's a nice area. There's a lot of arts and stuff up here, and you know, it's there aren't MAGA hats and um, that I've seen. <laughs> so I think that it's like a, it's a place that's not too far where people feel like they can move, and you know. Um, I've been wanting to for a long time anyway, just to get out from New York for a while. So, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are, you're in the village. Yeah, I'm in the village. Okay. And Armand, you're in, are you in this Manhattan? Or yeah, it's in Manhattan. In okay. 
Oh, and Chelsea. Okay. Yep. Um, why don't we? I hate to start if Matt. I don't know what happened. I he did say he was available. Um, yeah, didn't we do this at twelve thirty because that was the best time for him? Yeah, maybe he's just frying over a little bit. It's possible. But anyway, I did uh, I did text him, so he's got to, you know, he's got to know. So we can start. I mean, we sort of have. I don't mind leaving some of this in. Uh, I just um, I don't want to be um, frazzled by you know jumping all over. And I have these intros all ready to go. And I know there's going to be inaccuracies because it's all like from the internet, so it's probably mostly just fiction. But uh, right, I guess I could do it. I could do it um, and then edit it accordingly, right? Right. And I usually do these in the uh, during the in the my intros before anyway, so I don't know. I don't really even have to do it now, but maybe you can tell me if this is accurate. Okay, Godfrey Cheshire is not a not infrequent guest on this podcast, right? A North Carolina native. I first met Godfrey back in 2012 when after seeing his documentary feature, Moving Midway, I asked him to screen it with me for my film series in Brooklyn. Godfrey wrote for the New York Press from 1991 to 2000. Is that accurate? Yeah, through 2000. Yeah, through 2000, but has uh, right. contributed film criticism and editorial to the New York Times, The Village Voice, Interview, Film Comment, and others. He's also a founder of the Raleigh-based Spectator magazine. He's currently a major contributor to RogerEbert.com and lives in New York City. That's right. Is that pretty good? Or do I leave anything yeah, central? No, that's, that's fine. OK, good. That, all right, here's now Armand, who I've never really had a proper introduction to before. So Armand, please, of course, correct me. Detroit native. Armand White. Uh, Armand White's passion for writing journalism began in high school. Uh, he holds an MFA in film from Columbia. Uh, did you stay in New York City since uh, you graduated? Yes. Okay, so you've been in New York since. He's a member of the National Society of Film Critics and New York Film Critics Online and has authored four books. He has a, uh, he was a contributor at the, to the uh, New York Sun when in 1990, uh, 1997, Godfrey recommended, say again? It's the City Sun. The City Sun, thank you. Yep. Uh, let's see, uh, he was a contributor to the City Sun when in 1997, Godfrey recommended him to the New York Press for a film uh, critic position where he remained and built a reputation as a leading film critic until the Newsweekly shuttered in 2011. While uh, White is currently a popular culture contributor to both the National Review and Out. Well, you can say after 2011, I became the, well, first of all, go back to City Sun. Please. Where, where, <laughs> I, was, where, where I was the arts editor at City Sun. Okay. Not, not a contributor. And Thank then you. Uh, after 2011, I became the editor of City Arts. What year? That would be 2011. Uh. Okay. You know, you know, the history is that uh, New York Press became City Art. Ah. They just dropped the, they dropped the title. And right. It became City Arts. I see. Okay. <clears throat> and, and, and Matt's or sites, well, the hell with them. <laughs> no, no, I love Matt. Zoller sites makes his second appearance, <laughs> we hope. On the podcast, he's currently a TV critic for New York Magazine Vulture, as well as an editor at large at Roger Ebert, the, the editor at large at RogerEbert.com, a Dallas native. Site somehow also manages to publish on a regular basis, including most notably books on Wes Anderson and Oliver Stone. In 2005, Sites directed the film Home. His tenure at the New York Press was from uh, 1995 to 2006, as best as I can figure. Ad the... Adam, did... Adam? Yeah. Can I ask you? Did you did you mention moving midway in my introduction? Just that I showed it. And oh, okay. Sorry, that, well, you know, you're, 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 that we can t certainly uh, emphasize that again. What a great documentary. Well, well, if you just mentioned that I am the you know director of that film, and also um, the I'm the writer of the recent book uh, Conversations with Kirostami, the author. Oh yeah, we should definitely talk about. Yeah, we can even discuss it a little bit now. Why don't we? 
Um, I'm going to uh, take one more second. We can still finish right, roughly around 1.30. I'm not really uh, worried about, uh, you know, uh, just so I respect everybody's time. But um, um, there we go. I'm going to just try calling and see what happens. Well, as far as uh, including titles, so you might as well, <laughs> might as well for my introduction. We are might running include, uh, the first call. Well, the resistance 10 years of pop culture that shook the world and, uh, and then you can say my upcoming book making spielberg great again oh great when is that due out arma that should be out uh hopefully in november well if this doesn't go too badly and so far <laughs> i'm not so sure what you think but uh, uh if, if you if you if you maybe you'll come back on and t we could just talk about the book Glad to. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I, I would get a copy as soon as one's available through. Yeah, who's publishing? Uh, Resistance Media. Okay. I'm going to make a note so I don't forget. Uh, I'll redo these and then um, I'll put them in like, you know, the pre recorded intro then. And I'll mention all the above. So we, you know, cool. it's hard to do kind of capsule um, introductions. I'm not like terribly fond of them, but invariably you leave out important thing. What's important to somebody might be like not emphasized in what's out there, you know, uh, but you know, so uh, let's talk about, uh, I have a good idea. Why don't we use the time uh, constructively and we'll can talk about the, the stuff you've done as, outside of the New York press for a little bit. We'll, and once Matt, if and when Matt joins, we can then switch toggle to uh, the New York press and the book, um, which, you know, by the way, is called The Press Gang, writing on cinema from New York Press 1991 to 2011. Godfrey Cheshire, Matt Ziller Sites and Armand White. In the meantime, we can find out more about other other uh, projects. For instance, uh, uh, Armand, you mentioned uh, this, this new Spielberg. It's called, what was it called again? It's called Make Spielberg Great Again. Make Spielberg Great Again. And the, what is the, 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 uh, the thesis here that we're, we can look forward to? Okay, uh, the, uh, <laughs> well, the full title is Make Spielberg Great Again. Uh -huh. The Chronicles. And so it is in addition to uh, some new essays on Spielberg, it is a collection of all the Spielberg pieces I've written. Okay. And uh, it just so happens that, uh, how would I put it? <laughs> our careers sort of coincide or our, our careers parallel. Uh, when he started making movies is when I started writing about to a large degree. Mm -hmm. so, I've written about him from the beginning of his career, which is the beginning of my film criticism career, in a, in a sense. So when I've, did... Pardon me? So I've chronicled his career. And uh, so the book basically is a, it's sort of a, it's, it's both a, uh, it's a chronicle of both our careers. Mm -hmm. of our develop, of my development as a, as a film thinker, his development as a filmmaker. And... Uh, I take the position also that he's fallen from his great heights and can he be made great again? What would you, what, what would you say his last great uh, okay. film was? I would say his last great film was probably, well, not probably, it was certainly uh, the year of the double bill of uh, The Adventures of Tintin and War Horse. And then after that, then came the fall off. And so uh, those essays deal with the fall off, uh, what the cause might have been, and muse on whether or not uh, there's, there's any creativity or joy left. Mm. Do, what, do you remember when you were first, when you first uh, appeared on your radar? Like when, when you were starting out, as you described, uh, what film it was that, that you first uh, well, the first, We're first uh, the first theatrical feature, which would be the Sugarland Express, and uh, mm -hmm. you know a, a, a widescreen spectacular. I'm always partial to widescreen, and that was the that was my first notice that this guy uh, appealed to me because he knew how to mm -hmm. use widescreen so well, and then the uh, certain ideas about America, 
uh, about uh, humanity mm -hmm. and and about cinema, how how to present cinema as a way of uh, addressing uh, the popular audience. Uh, that that was apparent to me from the very first film. And, and it has mostly been exciting to follow how he, how he developed and went along that path, uh, movie after movie, uh, without, a, without a single dud. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's a, it's a remarkable career that uh, parallel, that, that equates to no other- Some parallel? That, 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 that is like no other filmmakers except I would say, in my opinion, D.W. Griffith. Uh, so I think he's a great he's a great figure in in cultural history, and uh, is worth pondering and trying to understand. And and despite the fall off, still still deserves the best wishes <laughs> uh, because, of, <laughs> sure. because and, of and because of his artistry and because of uh, the goodwill of those extraordinary films. Uh, he's earned mm -hmm. goodwill with those extraordinary films, and so we want him to be great again. Um, does uh, would you have evidence that you know? Do you know whether or not he has spread any of your work? Have you ever passed across? Have you ever had the opportunity to, to to just sort of chat with him? Uh, yeah, several times, but always brief chats. I mean, I never I've never been invited to dinner, but uh, <laughs> we've had brief yeah. and uh, and we've exchanged admiration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Adam. Yes. Say, you know, does, does not it does not influence my response ever. Uh, no, right. Well, you meet a great artist, but you know he's a great artist before we met, and was after we met until recently. <laughs> Joffrey. Yes. Um, two things of, about Spielberg. One thing is that people who see this uh, book will uh, see that uh, Spielberg is the the director that Armand, Matt, and I seem to have agreed on most during the period we were writing at New York Press. This is something that uh, people have mm. noted. And, uh, I've been up and down on Spielberg, but certainly I agree with the, the two of them about Spielberg's greatness and Spielberg's centrality to this whole period that we're uh, talking about of our writing. Um, the other thing is a personal thing. Uh, I saw in the press yesterday that his father died on Tuesday, the day of the publication of our, our book. Right. at age 103 and this wow. took me back to uh 1999 when uh, i had been the uh, chairman of the new york film critic circle for the previous year when saving private ryan won best picture and i set up the banquet uh for the prizes and we had them and uh at the front row was uh, spielberg and his table <clears> that included martin scorsese who presented to spielberg and uh, Terrence Malick, <clears throat> who went for the Thin Red Line at, a, at the second table, and then the third table was my family's table. And um, when I got up to introduce the last award, uh, I thought things had gotten very serious after Terrence Malick's award. That, so I, I made a joke. I said, Mr. Malick and Mr. Spielberg, you've made, both made these masterpieces about World War II. And um, I just want to suggest that if you, uh, if you have the chance, the next time you go out to make a movie about World War II, you include a part for my father, who's sitting right here and he fought in World War II, favorite actor, Dolly Parton. So I got a good laugh, I got a good laugh on that. And Spielberg stood up, and I mean, Scorsese stood up and presented to Spielberg. And when Spielberg got up, he looked at my father there at our table and he said, uh, you know, I made this film for you and for my father. Uh, yeah. both of whom were in World War II. And I was very, very touched by that. And it was obviously something that was just extemporaneous. But he was very gracious. And after the whole uh, thing was over, my father went over and spoke to him and to Malik, and they were both very, very gracious to him. Uh, but my father did like both of those films quite a bit. So I was very touched to see that Spielberg's father had, had died uh, at age 103. The last time I saw Spielberg, I, I brought up to him this evening, and he remembered it very well and asked about my father, who has since passed, and I asked about his. Wow. That's a great, great story. Thank you for that. Um, 103. Man. Right. What, 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 what good genes. 
So maybe Armand, yeah, may, maybe <laughs> maybe Armand, you're onto something. Maybe you'll be able to write a series of, of books at this point if he's uh, lives anywhere close to that age. Uh, he could definitely be making films for some time. Well, listen, at the rate he's going, he'll have to, he may have to reach 103 before he makes another good movie. Oh, <laughs> well, well, not for the not for the lack of trying. Matt Matt seems like he's getting on. That's good. Uh, and uh, what I was going to say was, uh, it's not usually the filmmaker's choice to stop the, making films at an old age. It's the industry that shoots them down and, you know, won't insure them or won't uh, give them the platform anymore. Um, I mean, looking at Clint Eastwood, you know, maybe a contemporary of Spielberg's, uh, you, you see it a real hope that, uh, you know, let, let filmmakers make movies as late as they want, you know, as long as they're civility yeah. <laughs> you know, I, that would be all right and like, yeah. uh, like eastwood he, he seems to be his own person and does the things he, he wants to do not, not yeah. things that he's assigned so you know, good chance that uh, there's more good work to come i hope so too yeah we, uh, matt hi how are you matt hey i'm really sorry about that guys okay. i uh I've got a bunch of personal drama going on with my mother and oh. father in Dallas, and, and I actually was going home yesterday when something else happened and I had to turn around and come back, so. Oh, no. A bit frazzled. It's oh, fine. I see. Well, we could have done this at another time. I didn't realize you were under so much uh, pressure. Or... Well, it's okay. It happened all of a sudden, and it just slipped my mind that we were doing this. But I'm yeah, here now, oh. and that's what's important. And I'll try to be yeah, did... charming to make up for being tardy. Thank you. Uh, how um, did you remember did you just remember or did you see something somebody sent you to remind you no godfrey texted me going why okay. aren't you on the call <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's happened to me and it's my show i've i've sometimes <laughs> I, you know it'll happen it's like you just get distracted by something you didn't anticipate and then i totally forget that even though i have it in my you know like a reminder pops i just i i don't know i'm very good at some of the like remembering things but then if some, i'm off course forget it you know it's, i'm also it's just, i'm also just i'm having trouble because of just the way things are this year with the pandemic and with being at home, it's like the weekends and the weekdays don't blur. They don't, there's not as much of a distinction as there used to be. And I'm also getting confused. It's like, is it Tuesday? Is it Wednesday? What day is it? And, you know, yeah. on top of that, you know, then the usual life drama inter intervenes and it's just a big cluster, you know, so. Well, thank uh, you anyway, for so what, uh, what can, I, what can I contribute to, uh, to this that these two gentlemen haven't already? Oh, well, we're just signing off. With. So thank you for okay, being well, here. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> um, Godfrey, just pop on the video for a second. We can at least get a little bit of a, of a uh, and then I'll grab a screen grab or something just so I can prove that all, I've got three New York Press or former New York Press. Well, it's not the the press people. It's I mean, it's not the critics. That it's, are like the being, it's, it's like being it's like being it's like being a marine. You're never an ex marine. You're a former marine. Okay, I, former. Uh, can you can you enable video again, Godfrey? Even if it's only for a moment. I, I, I just I, I just did that, and I saw a, a frozen image of me. Oh, okay. Fine. Now, yeah, another frozen image of me. I don't I don't really understand this. You okay. see an, a frozen image. Don't a frozen think, image of me. No, it's just black. Don't worry about it. I, I don't want to make too much of it. Um, and I don't want to frustrate you. So, I mean, it's not worth frustrating everybody. Uh, we hear you perfectly, and that's all that matters. By the, by the way, I have, I have a question to, yeah. uh, to Matt and Godfrey. In the back of the book, there's a photo of the three of us. I don't remember when, that, when or where that photo was taken. Do either of you? That yes, I do. Of... Yeah, Godfrey and I know. Yeah. yeah. It was an event at Lincoln Center, oh, yeah. uh, right, Matt? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. and that's Great. the only photo I know of the three of us together. Okay, that, that, that kind of rings a bell. Okay. okay. And I'm pretty sure that my daughter took that. Oh, all right. I couldn't remember who took it. I thought maybe I took it, but I don't think it. I don't think that's true. Okay, I just I I had not remembered, but now now <laughs> that rings a bell. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm glad there is one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the There's, one photo it's like the one the one snippet of film showing Bigfoot. <laughs> uh, was he also a former contributor to the uh <laughs> Yeah, Bigfoot had his own column. Russ hired him right out of college. 
<laughs> For, forgive the wordplay, but you all left a big footprint on. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, on film I'm, criticism. I'm out of here now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, Matt, you and last I think I last time I saw you. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Remember I was selling selling your book and Oliver Stone and you were That was pretty fun. I had a good Oliver's, time. Uh, Oliver's a trip. I'm still I'm still in contact with him. He'll like it's it's very strange. Like he seems to have uh, really embraced the uh, phone culture. Like he's using emojis. You know, I wouldn't <laughs> find that hard to imagine. Emoji guy, but but yeah, he a couple of years ago, I I sent him. You know, he said um, I, I sent him a text on his birthday, and I said, "I hope you're having a happy birthday, Oliver." And he he and uh, and he said, "Yeah, I'm on the beach with you know my wife and." daughter and it's great and i said all right well you know take care my best to you during the coming year and he texted back this emoji and it looked i've never seen this emoji before but it looked like the smiley face guy had been hit on the head with something and one eye was closed and the other eye was completely open and his tongue was hanging out and it looked like he yeah. was demented <laughs> that was sort of reminds me of like when i when I, the only time i had brian de palma on the podcast and uh it, at the end of the uh time we had uh I said, uh, I mentioned it was my birthday that day. And he stopped like, you know, before you kind of been, you know, just this is his 10,000th interview. So no matter what you're doing, he's not, he's not going to be thrilled to be interviewed. But um, at that point, though, he all of a sudden, he just on a dime, he shifted his whole, he came alive. And he goes, really? Like, he was just, he, I, I'm like, yeah. And he goes, are you, what does that make you a Libra? And he, <laughs> like, yeah, dude. I don't, I mean, it was, I just didn't expect all of a sudden that that would be the thing that woke him up and from his, uh, well, you know, people, sometimes people know, you know, they know how to, you know, I think probably all the, all the major directors have this skill, but they know how to strike right to the heart of you. And actually Oliver did that to me. I started dressing better in public. I started trying to develop a sense of style. Like it was probably about you know, not like I dressed badly or anything, but I started putting some thought into it when I was going to interview Oliver for the book. This was about 2013 or 2014. It was August and it was his apartment in New York. And I had just that morning dropped off my son to summer camp and he had gotten on the bus and I was wearing shorts, a t-shirt, uh, sneakers with no socks and a baseball hat. And I had my backpack with my recorder in it and I was outside of his apartment in lower Manhattan. And it just so happened that he was going there for the interview and he saw me from across the street. He stopped, his jaw hung open and he crossed the street and he stood right in front of me. And I said, Hey, Oliver. And he, and he started and he pointed at my clothes and he said, what is this? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, what are you wearing? And I said, Oh, I just dropped my son off at summer camp this morning. And he said, are you going with him? <laughs> and I said, no. And he, and he said, listen to me. And he put his hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eye. And he said, you're becoming a person of some significance, Matt. You asked me that you'll never, you'll never allow yourself to be seen in public dressed this way again. And I was like, yes, Oliver. <laughs> Good answer. What do you think of his advice? What did you do? Did you, I mean, it must have obviously, you, I'm sure you took that seriously, but did the very next day, the very the very next day I went to a, a, a store that sold a good good men's clothing and and found the guy who was in charge of you know putting a look together and I was like you got to help me man I can't have this happen again. <laughs> it's interesting, uh, Godfrey. Um, did you ever get any any, any um, I don't know uh, advice from Kirsami? Uh, no, I mean I I don't recall having asked him for advice or him volunteering advice, but I did spend a lot of time with him over the years, uh, here and there, and he was he was really a pleasure to be with, and uh, you know I, I miss him quite a bit. His death was was really a shock, um, but no, he he was sort of not the the kind to give you advice unless you ask something specific uh, of him, and I, I and then he was you know he was so good at understanding people and reading people that, um, you know, he, if I'd asked him for something, I'm sure it would have been very perceptive, whatever he said. It's interesting. You, I, would, uh, it's clear. I mean, I don't know, Matt, is, do you think Oliver Stone, if not the most impact on you, 
not talking about your favorite filmmaker necessarily, but just as somebody, like I think with Armand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but Spielberg seems to be the filmmaker who kind of, you have the most, I don't know, uh, synergy with in the creative, in the creative sense, or, you know, in terms of the work you've done over the many years. And I wondered if- Not really, actually, they're just the coincidence of our, of our parallel interest in cinema. <laughs> He's not the one, but he's okay. But he, he's not the one, but he's one of them. Okay, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, hey, God, uh, God, Armin, can I ask you? I was curious about this because I know that you're not as hot on Spielberg as you once were. You've really cooled on him. Is it mainly because? A, is it mainly a political thing? Do you feel like he's become too messagey, or or what is it? No, no. Uh, it's not mainly a political thing, but you know, politics. polemical. Pardon me. If he's gotten polemical, but I don't think he has. No, not really, no. Uh, but, I mean, politics certainly enter into it. It, it was, uh, you know, his encountering uh, Tony Kushner was both good and bad. Mostly bad in, in the long term, I, I fear. But uh, I think the villains have just not been good lately. And politics do enter into that, but that's not, that's not the reason why. But, it's, uh, but the politics are, are apparent are evident. Uh, the filmmaking is just not as good. You know, for instance, there's a, there's a moment in, uh, in uh, a Ready Player One where, where the protagonist's aunt is killed in an explosion and then she's never referred to again. And I thought, Jesus, you know, Spielberg was as perceptive, was it rather as sensitive as he used to be, uh, that kind of lapse would never have occurred. Uh, it's as if the kid never had a family relation. And once the family relation is wiped away, not a single thought about that family relation ever. Uh, so something else has dropped from his artistry and he needs to get that back. I thought that, uh, to me, I thought the problem, I, I like that movie better than you did, but I thought the problem with it was that he was, he kind of disappeared into his own navel with the respect of considering his own legacy. I think I think a lot of that film was about him assessing his own contribution to kind of the junk scape of popular culture, like inadvertent or advertent. Um, and I think he lost track of everything else. I actually liked the parts of it where I felt like he was grappling with his own impact. That could be, but it's unfortunate all the same. Uh, you know, I, I, I consider that that lapse to be to be really uh, kind of appalling, and uh, the, an indication that. It's, there's some something's gone wrong with his faculties. Uh, he's forgotten the things he used to know, uh, the, the 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 things that I thought were instinctual to him, such as un understanding the the depth of relationships between characters. So you know, all all of that has made a difference in his recent films. I I feel. I could give other examples, but the Ready Player One example comes to mind instantly. Where does like where does loyalty? And not loyalty, like walking, you know, following him over the cliff, that kind of loyalty. I'm just talking about uh, a t taking a, a filmmaker into the context of a career, within the context of a career, and allowing for, you know, for failures as well as enjoying the successes. And, do, you know, within the scope of a review, does it play into that at all? Should it play into it at all? Has it? Or is it? Well, well, when there are failures, they, that has to be accounted for, has to be recognized in some case, some way. Uh, but some people will some people will write about it, uh, like you know, I don't know if, if Godfrey had this with Kirstami, where you know you 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 kind of try to bring in more to a film, uh, to a critic, to a, an article or a, or a piece uh, about their career and about what they're trying to achieve or what they have achieved, and sort of. I don't, I don't, it's not, not into some way diminish a failure, but maybe to give it more context. I don't know. I'm just wondering. I, I, I tend to grade on a curve when it comes to somebody like Malik or back in the day and Altman only in the sense that the way that they work is so uh, unique, intuitive and mysterious that often the films that don't work and the films that work brilliantly are made from the same DNA. And it's often hard, like when I think about the fact that Nashville and the wedding were made, uh, what was it, three years, two years apart, three years apart. And they're very similar in the way they're constructed and the things that they're interested in. And 
I find the wedding to be only intermittently interesting, whereas Nashville, I just watched it again two weeks ago. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, these are things that I think are beyond the ability to just sort of rationally or, or scientifically parse. Like, I don't think you can dissect a movie like it's a like it's a car that isn't working properly, which is why I really don't like the kinds of reviews where they say, well, this would be a great movie if they cut 10 minutes. And it's like, first of all, which 10 minutes? And second of all, who the fuck are you to say that? And is you know? it, yeah, and is it germane? They didn't cut the 10 minutes, so what's the point of really? Well, yeah, yeah. And also, and also sometimes they, you know, sometimes, uh, and, you know, saying things like, well, it has a weak third act. Sometimes that's often said about a movie in which acts are not really even clearly on the filmmaker's mind. You know, like, how could you say of an Altman picture, like, it has a weak third act? Like, do you think Altman care? In The Player, he does. But in a lot of his movies, that's, the, that's really not on his radar. You know, there was some interview where Scorsese corrected the interviewer and said, movies don't have acts. <laughs> In fact, well, I, Armin, I, I remember years ago you said we were talking about 2001 and we and I was ta discussing it and you know in, in terms of how it defied this sort of three act structure that has now become a religion uh, for screenwriters and and I said I don't see it as having uh, three acts um, I see it as having four and and you said they're not four acts they're four movements mm -hmm. sure why not yes music <laughs> hey Zachary, yeah. How have you handled? I mean, ha, first of all, has Kiristami made a um, what's what what term shall we use? Like a, a just a, a film that you you know felt was mm, underachieved. Let's say. How have you handled that in your criticism? Because here's the, this is some guy who's obviously had an enormous impact on your on you as a human being, let alone a, um, a, a writer, filmmaker. Yeah, well, Kiarostami was, was definitely the filmmaker that had the biggest impact on me, both as a critic and as a person, uh, during the 90s, the period when I was writing at New York Press. I, I first you know, saw his films during that period, uh, and then I uh, started to get to know him, and I started to go to Iran, and I got to know him better and better as the time went along. Um, after he died in 2016, I looked back at his work and I thought about it and I, I, I saw it as falling into three periods, uh, each running roughly 15 years. Uh, the first period leading up was mainly his period of making short films in Iran and a couple of features uh, leading up to when he actually began to make features that made it into international attention. Uh, and that was in the mid 80s. And that period went from the mid-80s to 2000. And then from 2000 to 2016, when he died, I saw him as going into what I call his experimental period, which is kind of unusual because uh, sometimes directors start off being experimental and then get more and more kind of, I, I don't Conven know. Conventional? Yeah. Conventional, not saying that, using that word in a bad way, but just, but in Kiarostami, his second period, the period from 85 to 2000, I call his masterworks period because though that's the period where he made several features that got great acclaim around the world and that people came to identify with Kiarostami as an artist. And then after 2000, it seemed like he had achieved everything that he could possibly achieve in terms of the world's awards and recognition and acclaim. And it seemed like he just wanted to go back to where he had been kind of in the first period of his work, where he could do pretty much anything he wanted to. And he made uh, films during that period that, to me, are not great masterpieces. Their interest, every one of them, is interesting for a different from a different angle, but they didn't they didn't hit me uh, any of the films during that period as powerfully as the uh, uh, films from the previous period. And I think that's true of most critics and the public as well. Only only the film Certified Copy uh, was a set success, sort of box office wise, for sure. And even that was a mixed success with critics, I think in part because it was made outside of Iran. And critics, non-Iranian critics, sort of don't like to see Iranian filmmakers making films outside of Iran. So that was that was a factor there. But he was trying different things with every film. And that was one thing that I always really admired about him, was that he was never going to repeat himself. He was never going to go back to what he'd done before that had been successful. He always wanted to try 
different things. And some of these films were very exper experimental. They were films that really belong in an art museum and he did art installations too. So I, I think that's the distinction that I make. I, there was no film of his that I saw. I thought, oh, this is really terrible. But I will say that throughout his career, there were, I would see a film and I, it would just throw me. It was not what I was expecting because it was different than what had come before. And a lot of times it took me some time, I, I mean, even years to process the film and to see it as the way that I think it what fit into his career and it, you know, it, it's greatness uh, ultimately. Uh, you, you guys were, um, I guess your, your overlap in my intro, I'll mention what years you were. I think I were already mad. I, I was using some of the time to go over my written intros to make sure I didn't leave anything out or screw anything up. And the answer is I did in both cases, but, um, uh, your overlap period was 97 to 2000, correct? That's right. That's right. Wow. It was that brief. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it was through 2000. I, I left at the very end of 2000. And so, and Armin came in in uh, May of 97. So we had, you know, we had uh, 98, 99, 2000. We had three and a half years when we were all on board. So three, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting because, you know, wow. Because I, I remember, I remember that period you know of course like my my career was subdivided like I was doing that and I was simultaneously a television critic at the Star Ledger so it kind of I had one foot in each of those media and um, and I had and one was a daily and one was an alternative weekly so it was two very different newsroom cultures and that was interesting um, but I do it, looking back on it uh, what was happening during those three years in the New York press and in the film scene is more vivid to me. I think things became, in terms of just what was happening with form, what was happening with the medium, you know, television started to become a lot more interesting around that period. And I think at the turn of the millennium, that's when there was this explosion of people trying different things. And, and also the technology was changing. There was a lot happening. It felt very new. Um, but, but I remember the ritual of writing, uh, writing my pieces on a Thursday or Friday, uh, sometimes in the early days, I would physically walk them over to the puck building with it on a disc. And uh, I just because I liked the ritual of it, I liked walking into the building and walking in and handing it to uh, to John or, or Sam or whoever was there. Um, and, uh, and I was in constant contact with Godfrey and Armand. I saw them at screenings all the time. Uh, we communicated via email about various issues. And, um, and sometimes we'd talk on the phone. You know, and, so, and usually it was about movies, but not always. And uh, that was a very, very intense, vivid uh, time for me. Uh, very mean, you know, one of the most meaningful things that's ever happened for me professionally. Can you, can you talk about um, what the process was like? How the editor chose who was going to cover which films? Did you make a practice of, uh, you know, pitching? Uh, which ones you wanted to do? Uh, how, how did that balance? How was that balance achieved? Godfrey, do you want to take that? Yeah, let me do that because, you know, uh, Adam, I was the first one uh, to come aboard in New York Press in 1991. Yeah. And through most, most of those first four years before Matt came on in 95, uh, I was the only film critic. There were a couple of others that were used a little bit, but I was the, the main film critic. And uh, I wrote about whatever I wanted to write about at whatever length, and that freedom which I'd had when I was a critic in North Carolina before moving to New York was a great thing to me. I just really, really appreciated that. And so I could, I could, and I did write about things from the big Hollywood movies to the smallest, most obscure foreign movies. Now, once Matt came aboard, we kind of traded back and forth. Matt, I, I don't remember anything other than conversations between the two of us that were very uh, easy to, to decide uh, about who would do what. Uh, there wasn't, any contentiousness, as I recall, during that time. And then when Armin came aboard, because there were three of us, it was a little harder to sort of divvy things up. And the way that it worked was they made me film editor. And so uh, we, we sort of set it up that we had kind of a round robin thing that one week, uh, one of them got the you know top choice, the next week, second critic got top choice, the third week, the other got top choice. And 
but you know, we would discuss this and kind of argue back and forth about it sometimes. But the other thing about it was that the, the editors there were fine with me writing a review of a film and then Armin coming the next week and writing a different view of the same film. Really? So, yeah, mm. and, and this is something that I think is really interesting about the book and about this section of the book, when Thank all you. three of us mm -hmm. together, is that there's a kind of a, a conversation going on between us or among us about the movies that we're seeing. And I'm writing about what they think about it. They're writing about what I think about it. Um, and so this goes on throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, section or throughout that period. Uh, and it is something that I think really was engaging to readers. I think readers were, when all three of us were there, readers were very engaged by the whole section, I think. And people really paid attention to the back and forth between the three of us. Uh, but, you know, it, it was uh, not, not that hard to do, although I said, you know, we, we did have some disagreements, they would, disagreements would be certain, but often those disagreements came out uh, in, in what was written, and that was the best way to air them. There was a certain uh, amount of, of competitiveness with regard to wanting to be the, the primary, you know, to use that sort of detective show kind of lingo, like to be the person who, write, who officially writes the review. And I used to look at the release schedules and, and I would always, and I looked at them pretty far in advance of, you know, when they'd assigned a date uh, to the release of a film in New York, that was how we determined it. Uh, when it, when it appeared in New York for the first time, that was, that was considered to be the release date for purposes of our section. And I, I, I was deeply disappointed if I would look ahead and I would see, oh, the new Scorsese is opening, but unfortunately that's Godfrey's week and he's definitely going to pick that. Damn it. You know, like I, I would have those reactions. And then I was overjoyed when, uh, this is after Godfrey had left, but uh, The New World, Malick's The New World and, Mu and Spielberg's Munich were opening on the same day. <laughs> and, it was, and it was Armin's week to pick. And I'm like, I think he's going to pick Munich. Because I, I knew Armin pretty well by that point. And he did pick Munich. And I was like, I get the new Malick. That's not bad. If it's, you know, considering it's not my week, I still got the Malick, you know? And I wanted the Malick anyway. If it had been my week, that I, it would have been a hard choice, but that's what I would have chosen. And, and we did have some funny incidents where like, one, you know, one of us would try to find a way to write about it anyway. You know, like technically it wasn't our week to review it, but like, you know, it'd be like, uh, you know, a new, the new Catherine Bigelow is opening and, and, and uh, it's not our week to write about it, but somehow the column is about what we're theoretically reviewing, but half of it's about the new Catherine Bigelow. It was always kind of cheating a little bit. But I think that's funny, and in fact, uh, one, one, of my, uh, one of my funniest memories of all this is when Dogville was opening. And I hadn't written about a, a Von Trier film, just the timing hadn't worked out with regard to assignments uh, in a while. And I was, and I was excited, because that was my week to get first pick. And I'm like, well, I'm picking Dogville. Dogville. That's what I'm reviewing that week. I can't wait. And I'm rubbing my hands together like, yeah. And then... Uh, the preceding week, Armin says, I'm writing about Dogville. And I was like, how can that be possible? It's not opening until next week. And it turns out they were having an, a screening at the Museum of the Moving Image. And I called John Strasbaugh, the managing editor, and said, how in the hell are you allowing this? It's not actually officially in release until next week. What is this? Like, how can he, how can he be writing the review? And he said, well, we, Armin pointed out to me that it is the first appearance of the film in New York at that museum screening. And I said, don't you think that's a violation of the spirit, if not the letter of the law? And, and John's response was, yes, but it's clever, so I'll allow it. <laughs> Armand, do you have a, a memory of that? Uh, or? Oh, sure, I remember it. Uh, you know, we had developed, uh, I think, what Matt called the dibs system. <laughs> yeah. Certainly when there, when there was just two of us, so we had the dibs system. And... Uh, I respected the dibs system, and but I also was uh, thrilled. Uh, my entire experience at New York Press uh, is the experience of being thrilled at the freedom to write, at the freedom to express myself on culture, and and I took that opportunity every week, and it, it wasn't a matter of trying to outwit anyone, but enjoying the freedom to address popular culture. And uh, Von Trier was a thing at that point. 
And, and here was the new Von Trier film, and I wanted to hold forth on it. <laughs> so here was the chance to hold forth on it. Uh, but I don't, I, you know, hey, hey memory's a funny thing. I don't recall many examples where I ever tried to violate the Dibs agreement. Uh, or somehow <laughs> uh, okay. play fast yeah. play or play fast and loose. Well, with but you. I will say I will say that, you know, it is I I actually briefly studied uh, to be a lawyer before I decided to concentrate on art and writing. And so I do I do know how to read a contract and I know that there's more to the contract than what's on the page. Oh, the spirit of the yeah, word. but you know it doesn't matter because ultimately, like this, th this whole idea that we were rigidly segmented, like one guy was writing about one thing and the other was writing about something else, was kind of, it was pretty fluid anyway. And 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 you know it, we were trying to, and I know this probably sounds pretentious to some people, but we were trying as best we could uh, to 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 take into account the totality of film culture such as it existed in New York at that time every week. And so a review by one of us that was supposedly about a particular film might also refer to or might also refer to another film on a similar subject that had come out a few weeks ago um, or, or uh, some film or films from the past that were in some way related to that and also to something happening in culture, something happening in politics and, and uh, some changes in technology, which I thought Godfrey was particularly good at, at, at uh, uh, integrating that into his criticism, you know, that I don't think there's any better chronicler of the of the profound change that occurred in cinema as a result of digital technology than Godfrey. Godfrey was absolutely the guy for that. And and everybody you know and other people wrote about it but I could see that they were struggling not to acknowledge that Godfrey got there first and did it best. Oh. Uh, thank you, Matt. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm not going to disagree with a word. <laughs> I will say that. Very brave, I, I was, brave of you. That's very brave yeah. of you, Godfrey. I, I would say that uh, going back and looking over what's in the book, um, first of all, I was very, very glad that those, those that two part essay, The Death of Film, The Decay of Cinema, that got a lot of attention at that time and for a good while afterwards is in book form now because people have been asking me forever, when is that going to be in a book? And now it is and it's accessible. But the other thing is when I was reading back through uh, the period in the book where we're all together, 97 through 2000, I was struck by how many pieces that I wrote, uh, reviews of films, you know, quite beyond that one two part essay have to do or reference or in some way bring into the discussion the changes that cinema was going through technologically at that time. It was something that was very much on my mind and that I kept looking at and trying to think about uh, as we approached, you know, the, the total digitization of cinema. And I feel like it's a good record of what happened during that time and at least a good record of us as critics uh, thinking about it and looking about it and being aware of it because you're right, not that many other people did right at that time. A bit later, when it was you know, blatantly obvious to everyone, then people started to talk about it, write about it. Uh, but at that time, we were sort of out in front of the pack in terms of bringing it into the weekly criticism that we did. I, 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 looking back on it, I'm struck by how that, that was such a transitional period uh, the late 90s through the mid-aughts because uh, films were still by and large being projected on 35 millimeter despite um, certain all digital productions were being released at the Hollywood level, but it was really coming more from the independent sector and, and, uh, and there was a disjunction between the resolution of 35 or even 16 millimeter film and the resolution of industry standard video, you know, the, it was not what it is now. It wasn't 1K, 2K, 4K. I just directed a project where we had one camera that was a 6K camera, and we used that for the wide shots because you could punch in to create close-ups if you, if you needed one. And it wasn't like that. I mean, the, the, the cameras that were often being used to shoot these independent features, the, the, the so-called prosumer models, they were the only ones that a lot of these filmmakers could afford. And, and, and there was this entire complicated uh, uh, process by which you would, you know, light and shoot that in a way 
that was going to transfer to 35 millimeter film because that was the way it was going to be projected. You had to make a 35 millimeter film print at the end of it. And a lot of those films have a texture that is unique and will never be replicated. Um, they don't, they don't look rich and full and sharp, but there's something kind of ghostly and mysterious about it. And there's this alchemical thing that happens when you take something that's shot low resolution digitally, and then you print it to 35 millimeter, which adds, information and it and it deepens the shadows and it deepens the blacks and it gives them more texture and and uh and i think there was a lot of great work done there and it was not uh you know it wasn't what was considered industry standard but um i think um you know i wrote about that that was an area of special interest to me because i'm also an independent filmmaker and i and i shot i directed a feature using using an xl1 which was like you know that's like a baby camera now, like nobody would use that now, but it was, it, it was a very handy camera. Like you could really do a lot with it. And uh, 28 Days Later was shot with it and a few other uh, studio features. I think Spike Lee's Bamboozled was shot with it. Although for the life of me, I can't figure out why he lit that the way he did. I thought it looked awful. Um, and, um, and then uh, Armand, uh, I remember you, you and I were on opposite sides about that. Like you really thought it was a kind of a degradation of, of, of cinema that these types of movies were being made for the most part. I don't know if I'm remembering that right. Oh yes, that's correct. Uh, I thought it was a degradation. Uh, <laughs> those films were, they were, uh, they were a trial to sit through the films made during that, during that transitional period, that technological transition. Uh, they weren't up to snuff was the way I, I saw them. And, and I felt that that needed to be said. Uh, we part of the part of the pleasure and, and part of the part of the excitement of of addressing the culture as we were able to do it in New York Press was also being able to recognize that change as it was occurring, and also to apply aesthetic standards to it. And and for my position, not simply, I wasn't I wasn't willing to accept it just because it was offered. And, and I'm not saying that I knew what the future would be, because at the time, the future of, of digital filmmaking looked dismal. But I also was fully aware that, that, that for my eyes, it was also an affront. And, and, and I, I also know that some other moviegoers felt the same. Somebody, and I felt then that somebody has to say it. And that's part of the pleasure of being able to write it in New York Press, because we, I think we should never forget that we were in a position, a unique position there. Uh, at, at many mainstream publications, I think, uh, writers are obliged to uh, extol the new product because it is new product, because it does get advertised. Whereas we didn't have that restriction. We were able to, we were able to perform as critics, we were able to, to criticize the culture as it was happening, as it was transitioning even. And so, I guess the, good, the, the, the key example of that in the book is uh, the different reviews of uh, Blair Witch Project, which uh, was certainly, to my, from my perspective, a, an abomination. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, but other critics at the time felt, oh, this is the great new thing. But uh, I, couldn't, I, I don't see it that way. Hey, can we, oh. can, can, I, can I just ask you, uh, both of you, uh, for a second, um, can, I, one of the recurring arguments I have on social media about criticism is with people who have a perception of the idea of a critic as a person who tears things down. Like, and I think that it's understandable that there would be that confusion because we do say, you know, do you always have to criticize me? You know, what's the, per why, why would you say something so critical? Like, I think there's a bit of a blur there, but I wondered if, if we could take a minute and talk about what the word criticism means, just for anybody who's watching this, because I don't think I don't think as it's commonly understood that it really reflects what we were trying to do. You know? Well, we, I'm going to say that we knew what criticism is. Most people today do not. Uh, we knew that criticism can, is a, is in its own way, a, a, a literary art form. It's also an intellectual pursuit. We understand that. I think, I'm afraid to say that millennials don't understand that because they grew up in a different culture. They grew up in a culture where, where arts journalism had already given in to publicists. So for the past 20 years, they, they just haven't 
they're not accustomed to seeing criticism being practiced. But well, we're a different generation, and we knew what it was. We had we had uh, we had examples before us, and so criticism criticism isn't simply a negative thing. It's it, it's it, when it's done well, it's always a positive thing because it, it's searching to understand. It's also searching to analyze. It's not just wagging a finger at someone or patting someone on the back. And and yeah, I, I would. Fed art. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I would agree with everything that Armin just said. I think that all of us probably agree that criticism, the most important thing is that it be founded on real knowledge of film history and film culture. And then once you have that knowledge, which I'm afraid a lot of people coming in to write about film don't have or don't have in sufficient degree, uh, you're, you're ha having a discussion with the audience and with the filmmaker in a way. In a way, you're between the audience and the filmmaker and you're trying to evaluate, but you're also trying to explicate in a way what you think the intentions of the film are, where it fits into the culture, and also what your personal reaction is to it uh, as well. I, I think the personal always factors in. I mean, that, that's probably just assumed in some ways, but uh, I think with looking at the, the kind of writing that the three of us did, you see very strong individual points of view. Uh, Matt and Armin and I had very different points of view, and I think that's what's interesting about this volume, is it's just not one person's point of view. It's the three of us and going back and forth between what we think of different films. I really like the Blair Witch Project, and my, my very positive review uh, is in there uh, along with Armin's very negative review. I think that is sort of what you're, you're doing, is you're, you're part of a discussion that involves other people, that involves ultimately the audience, and I think the filmmakers uh, as well, and all the people that are a part of the film culture. But I think critics have a really, really important role in all of this, so that there is clear discussion and understanding. I think if you took critics out of it, a lot of uh, the way that people appreciate film as art when, when it is on that level would you know just be hard to pursue, because the critic is the one that's in there making that discussion happen and sort of moderating it in a way. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, and, and uh, the final piece in the book uh, is where I quote Annette Benning saying that artists or filmmakers operate under the watchful eye of critics and smart filmmakers think of it, should think of it that way. And uh, intelligent moviegoers should think of it that way too. It's not a there's not a fight between us, but uh, part of the function of critics is not to simply fall for what's what's offered to the public, but to try to understand it, to analyze it, and make sense of it. Uh, our job is our job is not is not promotion. Our job is criticism. And to yeah. and, and also to stimulate to stimulate thought to stimulate yeah. thought. Thoughts to put, you know, to put thoughts in the heads of other people, not in the sense of mind control or telling them what to think, but to just introduce an idea that may not have already been there. Oh, and, and, yeah. and, and, and for me, the, high, the highest praise that I get uh, from readers is to have them say, I hadn't thought of it in that way before. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with me. They may vehemently disagree, but I feel like if I have had them if i have caused them to have a thought that they might not otherwise have entertained i've won i've done my job sure exactly i i agree with that you know i don't i don't ask to be agreed with i ask to be heard there you are and considered yeah heard, right, right uh the name of the book we've been talking about is called the press gang and it's uh the writings on cinema from new york press from 1991 to 2011 with armand white Matt Stoller, Seitz, and Godfrey Cheshire. Thank you guys. And I just want to, uh, it also I felt like the, just to tag on to your, Matt, your, your um, emphasizing the neutrality of the term or the neutral term that is criticism in of itself, uh, that, um, uh, that aside from a specific review, the idea is collection of reviews, a collection of criticism is to champion film, right? It's for the, I mean, all, the collective good of making, uh, of, of making, uh, emphasizing what's the best part about film. So if there is a negative review, it's just to encourage great filmmaking. <laughs> I 
I mean, yeah. that, you asked that of Matt, but I got I I have to, I want to jump in and say no. You okay? <laughs> no, please I, no, take I, exception. I, uh, I I gave a talk at uh, mm -hmm. Lincoln Center a few years ago with this thing they have they call the Academy of Young Film Critics. Oh yeah, yeah. asked one of the young people, "Why did you want to be a film critic?" And this kid said, "So I can tell everybody about good about about good movies." And I, I had to take issue with that and say that's that is not that's not what's required of you as as a as a writer uh, as a, as an intellect or as someone who knows something and cares something about cinema. Uh, your job is not it's not promote it's not a job of promotion it's not a job to tell people how wonderful movies are it's a job to 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 through the evidence of your review. Uh, almost without saying, let people know that this is an art form that's worth your consideration, uh, that's worth every kind of consideration, uh, mentally, uh, sensually, visually, aesthetically, intellectually, politically even, not to promote the wonderfulness of movies. I, I can't help it, it's me. I, I, I kind of chafe at the, at the idea that uh, I'm, I'm just a movie lover. I'm not just a movie lover, but I am, but I am a, cultural per I'm a cultural person. I like art. I, I get a lot from it. I, I learn about life from it, and I get pleasure from it too, and uh, and that makes me uh, apply standards to it. Well, that's what I'm talking about, and I didn't articulate it, but I, I, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, the, as a the collect the the um, when you're writing, you know, tens of thousands of reviews over many many years, it's all for the passion and the love of the culture, and. The championing right. that so criticism has to enter that because yet you know right i mean we're just interested in uh, i mean i don't think you'd have a career if every movie was terrific but you know, I, know but I, 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 I may I, just be responding to the to the uh, rotten tomatoes culture oh yeah where, where, uh, I, I don't look i've never looked at people that. feel that uh, a movie a movie they like needs to have total agreement total positive acceptance that's I'm I'm reacting to that a little bit because I hear that, you. that's forgetting how to how to use our brains. One of the questions I hate the most from people is when I write a mixed review, mm -hmm. a particularly a wildly mixed review where there are aspects of it that I think are fantastic and others that I think are bad. And and they can, and they will you know tag me and they'll say like I'm confused. Did you like the movie or not? And it's like I don't know how much more clearly I could have stated my reaction. Like I, I, I thought the lead performance was brilliant and the cinematography was something I'd never seen before, but the film itself was really bad. And I said that, like, I, don't, I have nothing further to add to that. And I think, I think a lot of the problems, you know, I think the relationship between the general public and critics right now is more rancorous than ever before, because I think that their mentalities have been misshapen by a lot of cultural forces that are mainly about money. They're mainly about selling things. And I think that's why uh, sites like uh, Rotten Tomatoes and, and to a lesser extent uh, uh, Metacritic are so popular because people are primarily looking at this as a decision of where do I spend my money or where do I give my time? And I, I have a, a, a different attitude about that, which is I, if I go to see a bad movie, I don't consider it to be two hours of my life lost. I don't feel that, that the filmmaker failed me personally. I don't feel robbed or anything like that. It's like, because I had an experience. And if nothing else, you know, the experience of that miserable, horrible, amateurish film clarified my thoughts about what is a good movie. You know, so I always get something out of a movie, no matter what the movie is. Even if I come away fuming at how awful it was, it stimulates thoughts and like something that some thought that I had may show up elsewhere. Like it's never, the time is never lost for me. Hey, that's, that's great. Um, I want to, I want to uh, wind it down. Uh, and I just want to mention, uh, say one more or bring up one more thing in the t context of the New York press. Um, we live in a very different world rather than ask that common question, the future about the future of criticism or where are we at now in criticism? With the one thing, as I was saying early on uh, to Armand, was that I used to live down by Union Square when I was a bachelor and I was a young guy. And, you know, in the 90s, and I would grab every week, look forward to grabbing, opening that 
dispenser and grabbing my three copies of New York, I mean, my one copy of New York Press, you know. <laughs> the and, statute of limitations has expired. You can say three. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, um, you. thank you, by the way, for artificially inflating our circulation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that was the idea. Um, well, but the, 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 the printed piece versus a non-printed piece. It just seemed to me that it was always, uh, it, you know, you, you, Matt, you just talked about Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic as being kind of a litmus for a lot of people. But, you know, for me, a printed magazine or newspaper was a litmus in the sense that, um, it, you know, advertisers were involved. The cost of printing, distribution, uh, it gave it automatic credibility, which we don't have now. Uh, you know, the, the, the internet is a great leveler of, of content, for better or for worse. Last thoughts about that. Um, I, miss, I miss my New York press. I miss my Village Voice. Um, well, I, miss, I think that's I two different. That I think there's two different subjects happening here, and, and, and one of them is. Um, the thought process of reading something in print versus reading it online. And I'll be the first to tell you that it's a little harder for me to concentrate if it's online. Me too. Because there are other things happening. You're getting notifications, you're getting texts, you're getting calls. And also you are always aware that there is another thing you could be giving your attention to. And I think that's what contributes to poor reading comprehension. Like reading comprehension has never been great in this country. But I think it's gotten worse because of the inability to concentrate, which is, is I think our brains are being reshaped by these phones. I, I think that's, that's a big part of it. Absolutely. And, and, and reading something, when you read something in print, you, you are committing to that thing. And that doesn't mean you're going to read all of it, but it means you're going to start reading it and you're going to be focused on the thing that you are reading. And if you make a decision that this is no longer worth reading, you stop and you read something else. But it's not like there are five print things uh, pushing against your brain saying, read me, read me, read me. It's just a different thing. But, but as far as the other thing goes, um, I think that digital, you know, the kind of digital era has um, the great leveler you mentioned. I had a conversation with my publisher at New York Magazine one time where he said, um, I suggested doing a particular type of piece, and he said, uh, he was talking about why certain pieces were harder to get editors to okay there than others, and he said, the thing you have to understand is, and he said, 20 years ago, we were competing against other New York publications, mainly. Even though New York Magazine was a national and international publication, it was, it was most, of the, most of the action was in New York, and he said, our competition was the New Yorker, you know, the New York Times, the Post, the Daily News, the Wall Street Journal, and so on. And, and secondarily, you know, papers in New Jersey and Long Island and, and, you know, other city magazines. And now we are competing not only with them, but also with everybody who has a blog, everybody who has a Twitter account. Like, you're, every piece you publish about a particular subject is going to be measured in relation to every, so, every piece written about that subject anywhere in the world by anyone on any platform. And he said, it's just a much more cutthroat environment. And he said, that's why these so-called hot takes are so popular, because they cut through the clutter. When someone says, when someone publishes a piece in a major newspaper in, let's say, England, where a lot of this is happening, and they say, actually, the searchers is terrible. And people get angry and they go, how dare this guy say the searchers is terrible? And it's, you read it, and it's actually a very poorly done piece but everyone shares it and it's the same kind of crowd reaction that you get. It's like the equivalent of the person who opens the milk in the refrigerator and smells it and it's spoiled. And then they turn to you and they go, this is spoiled here, smell it. You know, like what's the point of that? But that, but that generates clicks in a way that a measured possibly mixed response to a work of art does not. And that's a flaw in the system. And it's one that unfortunately, I don't know if it's ever going to be corrected because everybody seems comfortable with it. Uh, Adam, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I I think uh, Matt and Armand and I uh, all agree that it would be great if uh, this book can lead to some younger people discovering the kind of criticism that we did in the '90s. Uh, you know, the the public the publicity for the book uh, talks about long form criticism, and that's that's really uh, true, and it's really an interesting aspect. We wrote long pieces. Uh, and these pieces were written uh, were written to be read in print, 
And you mentioned the thing of like going every week to take New York Press out of the one of the zillions of boxes that were around the city at that point. And it was a, kind of a thrill to me to not only watch people picking them up, but go to a coffee shop and see all these people reading them. And I think a lot in a lot of those cases, people were reading the whole article and they were into it for reading an entire argument. I never put what I thought, you know, was the sort of a summary of what I thought of a film into the first paragraph. You couldn't read the first paragraph and tell what this review was going to be about. You had to read the whole review. And I think yeah. Matt and Harmon wrote in that that same way. And I do think that the peak of American film criticism uh, has been the 60s through the 90s. And that was very connected with the print culture in the nation at that time. I think it was also connected with what was going on in cinema, which was a lot of excitement on a lot of different fronts and a lot of new things coming along. But I also think that it had to do with an educated audience that was used to reading things in print that were, you know, could be long, complicated arguments, and people really, really enjoyed that. And I think something really has been lost since then. And so I, I would hope that people uh, that are younger would go look at this book and read some of these articles and see this as a kind of a model of criticism that is really very difficult to practice in the age of, uh, you know, this instant gratification of social media and, and internet technology. Um, I can tell you that none of you, none, none of the three of you ever had an impact on whether or not I saw a film. I read, I read your, read you guys because I loved reading you guys. That's my, Great. you know, um, thank you guys. Can, Godfrey, can you do me a favor? Yeah. Can you quit and just, just like log in again? Or, and I just want to get one little like, you know, photo op of everything. <laughs> I could probably make it happen because you were on earlier, but, and then we'll, we'll you know, I, I, we'll see how that goes and then we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. But this is okay. fantastic. And I'll plug the book in the meantime again, since. Uh, I'll try to get back on. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, again, this book again, I, is uh, The Press Gang and it's published by Seven Stories Press. Um, any, I'm a, if you're a fan of criticism or you were, again, in New York in the 90s and the early aughts and are a fan, uh, pick it up, buy it. It's uh, really a great addition to my, my books. <laughs> I'm really glad to have it. I'm and really, really glad it exists. I'm really glad it exists. Yeah, I think it's, it's great. And, um, you know, um, yeah, everybody should get a copy who listens to this podcast. That's for sure. Um, so I should, I, I think uh, it will sell at least another 10 or 20. And I, <laughs> I, I, and I, well, I should wait for God for you guys like, too. That's like the moment in The Simpsons where they have the officer and a gentleman parody and, and, and Homer picks up Marge and carries her out of the factory and he announces to everyone on the factory floor, I'm leaving to go to the parking lot with my wife and I won't be back for four minutes. Uh, um, you mean that was a movie first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a whole other podcast, but you know, uh, we, if it wasn't for the Simpsons, I think cinephilia might have died out a long time ago. I can't tell you how many movies mm -hmm. my children have expressed interest in watching that they would not have been aware of if it hadn't been made fun of on The Simpsons. Amazing. Yeah. Including just very recently, the original Cape Fear. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, I'm not the original Cape Fear, but the, the Scorsese remake, oh, which okay. is what they're parodying. And they also are going to watch the original, too, because they didn't know there was it's an original. You mentioned Cape Fear, and I should tell you, I mean, I don't have to show you the, I don't even remember where it's on my phone, but uh, I got a text from um, the... Uh, Ileana Douglas. So, hello, hello. Yeah, I can hear you, Godfrey, but you, or did, did you enable video? Oh, there you go. You're right. Right. Hey! There he is in all of his splendor. <laughs> yep. Hold on. Let me, uh, get, let me get out of this curtsy and silhouette just a second. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And I was just saying, I, yeah, I, I, Ileana was a recent guest, and I've been talking about doing. Um, uh, but, uh, some some more episodes together, so she may be a 
on again, off again, co-host on here. Right? She's a bit of a film historian. <laughs> anyway, um, nice. I thank you all very much uh, for making the time and co helping coordinate this. It was a thrill to uh, have you all on here, like at one time. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Ar Armand will have yeah. you back on for the Spielberg book and... Cool, that'd be great. Terrific, okay, thanks. Signing off now. Okay, great. Godfrey, did you have anything you want to say? Adam. You guys can sign I off. I just wanted to say, I'm gonna email you, I'm gonna email you the voice recording I have of this. Okay, oh, sure, you'll have sure. that as a backup. Oh, thank you. Sure, sure, it's always good. Okay. Just in case, but thank uh -huh. you for doing that. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye. Goodbye, Thank everybody. you guys. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, Arma. Thank you. Okay.